Welcome to the lightning talk session on day four. So we have the third session today. Who of you visited the other two sessions? All right, nice. <laughs> we have quite a fan base now. So uh, let's see. Then you probably know all this of all of this. What I'm going to tell you. Um, I would like to give a short introduction for the speakers how to talk lightning here in this session. So if you if your talk comes up, um, yeah, make sure that you sit in one of the front rows. So you can get on stage quickly. And if you are up here, please talk into the microphone. Uh, also, remember to adjust it if you are a little taller or a little smaller than me. And don't move too far away from the microphone and don't turn around, because the audio will then not be picked up. So <laughs> you understand what I mean. <clears throat> then use the clicker to advance the slides back and forward, right and left and stay calm and simply deliver your talk. Then, of course, finish on time because we are the lightning talks. We have only five minutes for every speaker. After your talk, receive applause and profit. How to listen to lightning talks for the audience? It's pretty simple. Simply be excellent to each other, but also watch the timekeeper. The timekeeper is this colorful device here, which helps us to keep track of the time allotted to the speakers. Alex, would you like to say something about it? Yes, most of you should by now know how it works. During the first, first four minutes of your talk, uh, you get a green light, which just rises up to the top. And when it's like this, you might have still one minute left. And then to, it begins to turn yellow. These are the uh, last 60 seconds, and when the last 30, 30 seconds start, then it gets red. And if it's nearly on top, then your time might be over, and we absolutely hate to interrupt speakers. That's why five seconds before I need your help. Five, four, three, two, one. Uh, excellent. Thank you. Yeah, okay. I think we don't need to practice again. Um, yeah. They're all quite well trained. So uh, we have translations available from German to English and uh, English to German. If you would like to listen to the translations, please see the wiki on the translation topic or streaming.c3lingo.org uh, because we don't have decked phones this year. So there you can get some instructions on how to listen to the translated streams. All right, I think we can start. Let's do that and begin with the talks. One more thing, please leave the clicker on the lectern here. <laughs> All right, let's go. Okay. Uh, so I would like to talk about the IoT and its problems and my attempt to solve it. Uh, so basically, uh, IoT is useful. So let's say you have a, a IoT thermostat and you want to set the temperature on, when you are going back to your home and when you are in your home, you, 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 the, the home has the temperature you want. Uh, and, but there are problems with IoT. Um, for example, most uh, IoT solutions use cent central server, which is operated by the manufacturer of the device. So of course the users can be spied by the manufacturer. Uh, which uh, the, the devices also can be disabled uh, by the manufacturer, which is, I think, worse. And it actually happens. Uh, see, one of the Google Nest devices, uh, they ended support after something like three years, and uh, it stopped working. And users, and users had no choice but to buy new. Uh, and of course, most devices need internet to function. So when you have internet outage, you can adjust the temperature of your home. Uh, which is like really bad, uh, and like I, I, made, I made a small diagram on, on how this works. Everything connects to the central server, and then you use your phone or your computer to connect to the server operated by the manufacturer and give commands to these devices. Mm. So 
the solution uh, which uh, I, would pro I would propose is overlay networks. So basically, uh, everything connects directly. Uh, the, fo the phone app connects directly to the device. And when the device is not in the same network, it might use some help from the central server, which uh, is uh, operated by manufacturer or other party, but it really doesn't know what uh, the data is sent, and it is not specific to the device which is used. It just helps to establish connections over the internet because it's hard to tunnel over n n nuts and firewalls without help from a server. Mm. In uh, my overlay network, HustlerNet, uh, I've took inspiration from some of uh, other other projects like CIAD DNS or uh, Zero Tier, and uh, every um, device is identified by a uh, by a hash of its public key, so that secures the uh, connection, and. Uh, mm, the, public, the, pub, the, the, the hash of the public key is unique, it's long enough, so it's also its global IPv6 address, and uh, like only knowing this ID, you can connect to other device. So for example, when you uh, uh, pair the device to your phone, you can just check if it has the same ID as uh, uh, you, you, are, you see on your app, and be sure it's the same uh, device. Mm. So you might... Uh, wonder why I did that, when there's, for example, Zero Tier 1, uh, which uh, is um, an overlay network which uh, uh, has uh, most of these characteristics. It also uses uh, hashes of public keys uh, to uh, establish authenticity of the nodes. Uh, I wanted to uh, make sure my solution can work on, the on embedded devices. Uh, so, essentially, Zero Tier uses 4 megabytes of uh, RAM, and you can get around this uh, due, due to design limitations. Uh, and hopefully, uh, and hopefully, Husternet can run on uh, most embedded devices. For example, it's ported to ESP32, and also, it also has a more uh, permissive license. Uh, I think that most companies don't like GPL, uh, whatever they think about that, uh, so they won't use uh, GPL software. Mm. Okay, and when I am here, I would also like to recommend you the open source project uh, uh, Robot Operating System, which was actual, actually an inspiration for creation of this overlay network. I wanted to uh, be able to run parts of robots uh, on, different, on different computers, which are even not in the same network. Robot Operating System has built-in uh, support for uh, running one part of robot on one device, another part on other device. And it actually has a lot of helpful libraries, so you can, uh, in many cases, you can just write like 10 lines of code, and uh, everything like mapping uh, and uh, navigation will be there in robot operating system. So thank you for your attention. Uh, like you can uh, visit the website if you uh, want to know more details. Thank you. Next up is uh, software citation, closing the gaps in software citation workflow. Okay, thanks for coming to the talk about software citations. Uh, very briefly about me, I'm kind of a software librarian, I guess you could say. I work at the National, German National Library of Science and Technology in a project dealing with software sustainability, research, software development, and fair data principles, but I'm not here on behalf of my employer. Um, so, the state of the citation, as you probably know and heard at this uh, Congress, uh, scientists use uh, citations to credit each other in their work, and mostly this happens by uh, citing journal articles and books. Um, as we've also heard in the last few days, there's quite a bit of improvement potential uh, in this system. Um, the reproducibility crisis but uh, has also uh, led to some improvements. For example, data sets and raw data are more and more becoming acceptable, publishable and citable units of work in their own right. Um, of course, if you talk about data, software is not far away. So the same is becoming true for software as well. It is increasingly being recognized as a 
standalone product of scientific work. So the, um, the citation infrastructure for that is, of course, quite important to give due credit to the authors of software, to the testers as well, and to everybody who's involved in scientific software. There is some community infrastructure projects that deal with that already. Um, so, for example, Debian Science, the R community is uh, quite advanced in this. Uh, SW Math is for the mathematics community. Softwareheritage.org is uh, archiving just the source code and uh, supporting citations in that way as well. Um, but I want to talk about uh, some solution examples which are quite easy to implement for everybody, regardless of whether you are uh, involved in one of these communities or not. So, for example, if you have a GitHub repository and you, want, and you want your software to be credited in the academic world, you can very easily connect it to a service called Zenodo, and then for each Git release tag that you create in your repository, you will get a DOI, a digital object identifier, minted. Uh, for you, and this DOI is the backbone of academic uh, citations. So this is very easy to do, and you get a free backup at CERN, so that's cool, right? The next option is simply citation files. So in many repositories, you probably uh, see these uppercase letter files that somehow express the wish of the author of how um, the license should be applied, for example, what should happen if you copy the package and so on. And citation files are just the same. You make a wish as long as you can express your wish in BibTeX format. So uh, in this ggplot2 example, for example, uh, Mr. Wickham, the author of several R packages, he usually wants to have a book cited, not the software package itself, but a book he wrote about this. Uh, but don't be shy. There is an add software citation key in the LaTeX and BibTeX world, so you can also try that. Um, the compatibility there is quite good. Um, not perfect, but uh, it's pretty good. Um, and yeah, you can look at some examples if you're interested. Um, the next, now we move into the realm of, of automatic generators because you don't really want to type a JSON out by hand, I guess. Um, there is a tool agnostic uh, code meta JSON uh, standard format, um, and uh, the example you see here is from an R package that generates this JSON file from the community native uh, metadata format uh, about R packages. It's called description, um, and it has yeah, some basic fields about the software package. So, these examples were about offering the metadata, and that is necessary, of course. So, if you're a researcher and you find an interesting software package, you, of course, just need to know which uh, metadata the authors of the software package want to have cited. So, offering these metadata is the first step, but it's not sufficient. If you want to do more, uh, especially next year, looks to be quite interesting. There's a project coming up, siteas.org, which will um, maybe like sci up a little bit, make it very easy to find out how you can cite a specific um, academic work. There's also a citation file format being discussed, uh, if you're interested in that. Um, some upstream work would, of course, be interesting. So Code Meta R is just one example from the R world that I showed you just now. But other IDEs, other languages uh, usually also have their own metadata formats, and including like generators uh, to support this generation of yeah, this kind of ab abstraction layer for the citation metadata in Code Meta JS would be quite interesting. And also for the users, we, of course, need easy ways to import the uh, citation metadata. For example, reference manager Zenodo uses translators, JSON files to extract the bibliographic data. An example, media, wiki, uh, media CCC.de has not yet uh, a video extractor. You can cite YouTube, but you can't cite media CCC. So thank cool. you. That's contact information. Bye-bye. <laughs> thank you. So one thing that comes to my mind right now, if you want to look up some information on the talkers, you can always look in the wiki. Uh, we have the schedule of the Lightning Talks there, where all the talks are linked, and most of them have also put their slides online. So if you need further information on a talk, don't hesitate to look that up. All right. Then we will continue with climate change. Um, hi. So I'm going to talk about the economics of climate change. And I assume you are already familiar with it, with climate change, so I'm going to be real brief. Uh, climate change is not a new phenomenon. We've had a roughly one degree increase over the last 100 years. And we also have a correlation to what that cause might be. And uh, that is the CO2 level in the atmosphere. 
And we don't only have a correlation, but we also know the principle behind it, and that is the greenhouse effect, which has been studied for roughly or almost 200 years. Um, so one degree more or less, or even two or three, I don't, cannot feel it, so uh, why should I care? And the reason are the damages that uh, are incurred by global climate change, uh, where your um, damages are extreme weather events like hurricanes, floods, droughts, um, glaciers that are vanishing, unbearable living conditions, not so much in Europe or um, the US maybe, but in places like Bangladesh where peak temperature is um, already pretty high. Um, and also topics like food security might become a problem. And eventually, um, even extinction is not off the table. It's really unlikely, but it's not impossible. Um, so this is another example of sea level rise with just one meter. If you're um, familiar with Germany, then you know that one meter increase would be a devastating uh, damage. Uh, so should we now radically stop CO2 emissions? Uh, the answer to that is no, um, because we actually have a benefit of emitting CO2. Uh, because this conference would not be possible without CO2 emissions. You wouldn't have been able to travel here without CO2 emissions. Uh, so the question is, uh, what are um, the damages here? Because we already know the benefits. You already booked the ticket, but the problem is that you would go all the way down this benefit curve until you hit zero, where you don't get a, an additional benefit out of an additional emission. So we somehow need to find out what the damages are to find an optimum. And there's a concept here that's called the social cost of carbon, which tries to aggregate all the damages that ever happened due to climate change for an additional ton of CO2 emitted. And this is a really quirky concept because it has some ethical caveats, uh, because you eventually assign a value to a life. For example, this is like really what you don't want to do, but it's a really powerful tool to assess the damages. There's other problems here too, like uh, aggregation problems in a highly unequal world, um, and also interpersonal um, comparisons. Uh, and the entire problem is hugely multi-generational because the damages might incur 100 and 150 years from now. So the discount rate that you use is intensely important. And Trump, for example, uses 7% while you can, could argue that 1.5 or even 0.1 is uh, more reasonable. Um, so we somehow need to get these damages. Now we know the damages into, um, to, to find this optimum, to get to the optimum amount of emissions. So we need some kind of uh, policy making to uh, enable this. And the problem is that it's an externality. So there are three major ways to include an externality. So like where you don't have to pay for the costs you uh, incur. And one of them is command and control, where you just uh, forbid, uh, for example, you would forbid internal combustion engines or planes. Um, then there's the fixed tax, the Pigouvian tax, where you would just say, hey, there's a three, $30 uh, dollar tax on a ton of CO2 emissions. And we also have cohesion bargaining. You can look it up, it's interesting, but it doesn't apply to climate change. Um, so either way, um, there's also an emission trading scheme where uh, you cap the amount of CO2 and then have a trading on it. And either way, which you choose of those, you end up with a carbon price. And that way, um, we actually have um, those damages accounted for. And only then do we find uh, at least somewhere close to an optimum, because right now we are far off the edge to the right. Um, so what I want uh, to, you to take away from this is that climate change is real. I know it doesn't give you a fuzzy feeling in the, in the stomach if you talk about it, um, but the damages are real. And it's, it's not only an environmental protection thing, but also a human protection thing. Um, so, but there are also benefits to CO2 emissions. And we should try to find an optimum there that we get the best for society and the best for everyone. And to do this, uh, I would propose to use uh, a global CO2 price uh, for emissions. Thank you. Thank you. Next up is evolution of the key card library. Did I pronounce that right, key card? Is it called KeyCut? Is it pronounced um, it's correctly? It's a talk about the KeyCut library. Yeah. So I um, will talk about the development of the KeyCut library in the last few years for the people who do not know what KeyCut is. KeyCut is an open source electronic design automation tool, which in simple terms means you can design PCBs in it. I joined the KeyCut library team about two years ago. At that time, the library consisted about 
eight repositories and more. That means uh, quite hassle to maintain for the maintenance as well as to contribute. The library is now over 10 years old and it didn't follow our convention, so we started refactoring. Unfortunately, refactoring is not so easy. The fact that KiCad, how should I say, um, when you edit the symbol in KiCad, it's automatically updated in the schematic, which is very problematic. For footprints, that problem doesn't exist. When you use a footprint and you update it, it's not propagated to the PCB. 3D models have the same problems as schematic symbols, and so we updated our library and the schematics of users broken. So at the current stage, we are refactoring the library to have three distinct repositories, one for schematic symbols, one for footprints, one for 3D models. This should simplify maintaining and also distributing and contribution. We also changed the license of the Kigat library. It's now copied by the same attribution plus some exception, which means you can include our schematic symbols without being affected by the license because it's, um, we say it's adapted work. So you can use our library in commercial projects without a problem. I mean, I calculated some numbers about the current state of the library. We have about 9,500 symbols and 8,300 footprints. We have no atomic uh, part library, which means the parts our library describes is much higher. About half of the footprints also have 3D models, now with step models, which means uh, the upcoming KeyCard 5 release has full step support, which is a highly requested feature by more professional users. In the future, after KiCad 6, after KiCad 5, KiCad 6 uh, will introduce a new schematic file format. We already have this in mind, so the problem on the user side does not happen again. A big amount of the library also is script generated now, which means in the future you probably can specify your own naming conventions, your own courtyard distance, and such things, and generate, generate your own standard library from scratch. Thank you for your attention and for questions, please come personally to me later. Thank you. Next up is uh, Rundfunk Mittenbestimmen. Okay, hello everybody. My name is Robert. Together with a group of volunteers, we're developing a web application called Rundfunk Mitbestim. You can see the URL over there, rundfunk-mitbestim.de. Uh, we are also on Twitter, on Facebook. You can write us an email, and we develop uh, free and open source software. So there's also a GitHub repository. Since 2013, every home in Germany has to pay for public broadcasting, and there's no legal out anymore. And we thought, well, if everybody has to pay, why doesn't everybody get a say? And we thought maybe a software can provide a solution to this. And this is Rundfunk Mitbestim. It's online, you can try it out. Um, more than 800 users already signed up. I will not give a live demo because of time, but I can show you this picture and explain to you how the system works. Basically, it's just a matching between you, the users, and broadcasts, TV, online, or radio broadcasts. You have a virtual budget of 17 euro 50, and you distribute it on those broadcasts you want to support. And this creates interesting data, because, for example, you can see trends if you compare it over time. You can see what are the most important categories. You can even do something like collaborative filtering. And even though this idea is very simple, it's actually dead simple, no one ever tried this before. Um, so this is interesting and surprising. Uh, one reason to have this prototype is also to test assumptions. And maybe you think, well, certainly the results will be the same, like the TV rankings or the radio rankings. And you can see the two companies that are responsible for those rankings below. And, well, apparently it is different uh, what you want to support from what you listen to or what you watch. And you can very, very verify that statement by just visiting the website 
support some broadcasts and check if those are really those that you regularly watch or consume. Yeah, this uh, web application already attracted some media attention. Uh, for example, Deutschlandfunk and Netzpolitik uh, had an interview with us. So this seems to be something important, and because this seems to be something important, we will reg um, register an association next year. If you want to become a member, just come to me afterwards. Um, and one thing that I noticed um, when talking to journalists, especially those that are working in public broadcasting, is, uh, well, if we really let people decide, then we will not be able to deliver our quality anymore. Like, we will, the public value will deteriorate for sure. And by that, they mean this quality. And um, one has to know that public broadcasting has a political and educational mandate. It is for everyone. Uh, it is uh, for free, uh, open access to information. So you can create your political opinion, for example. And that's also the reason why they can actually charge you. I googled that. I googled the question, what is actually public value? And I found this amazing quote. Uh, public value is what the public values, right? That's what you value. Right now, people in broadcasting and the system themselves, they decide what is public value because they decide which shows are going to continue or which are going to be cancelled. So we try to create a means to measure this public value with Rundfunk Mitbestimmen. Now, if you think that sounds interesting, um, you can just come to me after the talk. Uh, there's more about this topic than I can put into a lightning talk. Um, you can also just contact us. Um, in any case, uh, I want you to visit this website and publish your data. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next up is crowd filter. Morning. So, I have a, I'm Cookie. I have a research project at the TU Dresden right now. I'm, it's called CrowdFilter. And the idea is to experiment with client-side filtering instead of using um, server-side or platform-side filtering. So if you have a platform like Twitter, Facebook, Reddit, all the other ones, um, with user-generated uh, user content, all these platforms are in the need to regulate their content. They have to employ people who check reports and delete content. And um, it's, for example, it's illegal content, clearly marked as yeah, illegal against the law of the country, which the platform operates in. And uh, things like copyright claims or personal claims, deleting of personal photos, and so on. And uh, the pressure on these platforms is uh, if the people feel that the platform does not regulate, uh, for example, harassment or hate speech, the users will leave because they don't feel welcome anymore. And uh, on, the, on the regulating side, on the law side, states also have uh, methods to uh, put pressure on these, uh, on these companies because they can use fines, like with a new NetzDG, or they can uh, get uh, in a lawsuit because they still host illegal content after it was reported, and it's a legal risk for those companies. And the consequence uh, we see, for example, with Facebook, uh, they employ third-party companies to regulate the content that was reported. And um, in, like, Google, for example, uses a lot of algorithms which are, well, operating mainly by themselves. And uh, the problem is that who watches the regulators? So we have no regulation control mechanism because, uh, for example, the platform could decide to prematurely delete content just to avoid any, any, uh, any law cases. And this would mean that content would, uh, that would not be illegal would be still deleted. And uh, the questions came up. Um, how do we know that the deletion of content is not censorship? So how do we know that um, content that is reported and deleted is not, uh, in fact, censorship? And the uh, second question, shouldn't we uh, discuss all content that is online, uh, available online, that people post online? 
because we cannot have a broad discussion about content if the content just doesn't exist. And um, third is a more technical question. How can small platforms be supported to regulate their content who cannot employ thousands of people who delete illegal images? And this is where our project comes in. It's um, currently in a prototype testing phase. It's a Firefox web extension add-on. Uh, we are currently in phase one. It's the classification phase. And the aim is to um, uh, collect a lot of um, web content, like the keywords and uh, text, text content, with some classifications. And phase two would be to use those classifications that were crowdsourced um, to generate filters and then push them back to the client. And the client can then decide, OK, if I have a text content which has a high probability of being hate speech, for example, I don't want to see it. And it's filtered out by the add-on on the client side. Uh, for example, it looks like this. We have a tweet here in this example. Um, if you have the, the permalink tweet, uh, you see the button crowd filter, and then you can click on any of these classifications. And then the add-on takes the, the tweet content and the link of the tweet with the classification, sends it to the server, and it's stored in the backend. Uh, second example is uh, GitHub issues. It's the same, it's working the, the same um, with the button and the classification. And uh, for the back end, it looks like this for, uh, at the moment. It's uh, just simple display of the text, the URL, and the classification with a client ID and the timestamp. Uh, if you're interested in this project, um, or if you just want to look, have a look at the web extension, it's ported to the newest, uh, new standards. It's uh, at crowdfilter.bitkicks.eu. And um, I would be very happy if some more non-technical people give me feedback because I have a lot of feedback from linguists and uh, sociologists which were very unhappy with my choice of uh, classification words without explaining what I mean with them because it's a very broad term like hate speech. Three. Yep, thank you. Thank you. So next up is Exploding Stars. Good morning. Let's talk about astrophysics. A long time ago, in a galaxy not so far away, this star exploded, shining as bright as a whole galaxy. This is a supernova. And explosions like these are where many of the chemical elements around you come from. So whether it's oxygen in your lungs, or calcium in your bones, or silicon in your favorite computer chip. Life on Earth, as we know it, could not exist without supernovae. And yet, we don't really understand how these explosions happen. And even observing them with telescopes doesn't help us figure that out, because telescopes can only view the surface of a star. They can't look at the center of a star, where the explosion actually starts. So that's why, instead of light, I use elementary particles called neutrinos to observe supernovae. And neutrinos are like ghosts. So they can quite literally go through walls or through your body. And in fact, we can do a little experiment right now to try and detect neutrinos. And to help me with this experiment, please give me a thumbs up. Excellent. So there's two things happening right now. First of all, you folks are giving me a massive confidence boost, which is great. But you know, more importantly, somewhere out there, the sun is shining, and it's producing a lot of neutrinos in nuclear fusion. And these neutrinos are flying to Earth, through the walls of this building, and then through your thumbnail. And right now, as you're listening to me, around 60 billion neutrinos from our sun are flying through your thumbnail every second. 60 billion neutrinos flying through your thumbnail right now every second, and you don't feel any of them, right? So that's how ghost-like, how weakly interacting neutrinos really are. And I'll give you a few seconds to stare at your thumbnail in amazement. 
So, I think this clearly demonstrates that neutrinos can escape, even from the center of a star, and bring information about what's going on there to Earth. But, of course, to detect them, because they interact so weakly, we need to build a giant detector. In fact, we're building two of them. This experiment is called Hyperkamiokande. And even after working on it for three years now, the sheer size of it still blows my mind. I mean, you could literally fit uh, basically the entrance hall here at Congress into one of those tanks. And remember, we have two of them. So the second one is still free, and you could drown Lady Liberty in there, which is probably some sort of political metaphor nowadays. And what's more, we're building that inside a mountain, 650 meters underground, so that the rock on top of the detector acts as a natural shield against cosmic rays, so all sorts of other particles that are raining down on our atmosphere from outer space. Now inside the detector, there's ultra-pure water. And all over the inside walls, we have these basically very sensitive cameras, which can detect even a single photon. So when a neutrino hits one of the water molecules in the water tank and kicks out an electron, for example, that will create a tiny flash of light. And um, from the brightness of these flashes, we can determine the temperature and the density inside the supernova, because a hotter and denser supernova will produce higher energy neutrinos. And by counting the number of neutrinos, um, by effectively counting how many neutrinos, or measuring how many neutrinos are emitted at every single point in time, we can figure out what reactions are going on inside the star. So that way, we can watch millisecond by millisecond how the star explodes and plants the chemical elements necessary for life in its cosmic neighborhood. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next up is Photopia. Morgen. Okay, ähm, ich habe euch ein paar Bilder mitgebracht und ich werde euch erzählen, was mir und anderen Leuten an diesen Bildern gefällt und was uns nicht so gefällt. Und äh, ich werde nicht die ganze Lösung ausbreiten für das Problem, was wir sehen. Ähm, genau, aber in erster Linie sind wir auf der Suche nach Unterstützung oder nach Anmerkung. Ähm, diese Bilder. Rechts unten Snowden Soli 2013 vom Bundeskanzleramt. Links oben Hamburg, 1. Mai. Rechts unten Gorleben-Proteste. Auch Klimacamp. Rechts unten das letzte Ende Gelände 2015, muss das gewesen sein, im Tagebau Wenzloh. Und diese Bilder sind visuell ansprechend. Diese Bilder haben eine hohe Qualität. Vielleicht sind wir uns da einig. Und diese Bilder haben ein Thema. Wir benutzen öfter das Wort sozial, engagierte, sozial engagierten Fotojournalismus. Und ähm, pathetischer ausgedrückt würde ich sagen, das sind Bilder, die einerseits ähm, vom, von den Müden beim Aufbau einer neuen Welt zeugen, als auch die Kämpfe gegen die alte Welt. Und das Problem mit diesen Bildern ist, ähm, sie sind nur die Spitze vom Eisberg. Ich habe jetzt natürlich die genommen, die super lizenziert auf Flickr zu finden sind, aber was man bei Flickr findet, ist einfach ähm, super gering, gemessen an dem, was tatsächlich tagtäglich entsteht in diesen Auseinandersetzungen, von denen ich erzählt habe. Ähm, die Lizenzierung ist dort oft unklar, sie sind journalistisch öfter oder oft schlecht dokumentiert. Aber sie werden gebraucht, und zwar von, von Linken, also man muss es ja heutzutage dazu sagen, emanzipatorischen, solidarischen und nicht 
faschistischen politischen Strömungen für ihre Medienprodukte, werden sie gebraucht und es gibt sie halt kaum. Also hier Stuttgart 21 bei Flick Air, das ganz schönes Ergebnisrauschen, würde ich mal sagen. Äh, damit kann man nichts anfangen, wenn man irgendwie in, weiß ich nicht, in, in zwei Stunden irgendwie Deadline hat fürs Layout von, weiß ich nicht, von der nächsten Broschüre. Ähm, Abmahnung, das hier aus dem Oktober. Irgendwann passiert mal wieder ein Fehler. Also ich habe das in meinem Bekanntenkreis, Freundeskreis. Einmal im Jahr, alle zwei Jahre macht man doch mal was falsch bei der Lizenzierung und dann nimmt sich garantiert eine nette Kanzlei dieses Fehlers an. Deswegen haben wir gedacht, selber machen lassen. Wir sind leider nicht so Techies. Das heißt, wir können das nicht komplett selber programmieren. Wir wollen aber, das ist unser Vorschlag für diese Lösung, äh, das ist unser Lösungsvorschlag. Wir wollen eine Plattform begründen. Es gibt auch schon eine Kampagnenwebsite, die heißt Photopia CC. Und da geht es halt darum, einerseits die Qualität zu sichern, was ich gerade meinte, Ergebnisrauschen bei Flick Air, Rechtssicherheit durch eine klare Lizenzierung. Also derzeit sind wir bei Creative Commons, Non-Commercial, weil es auch nicht darum geht, den etablierten Fotografinnen und Fotografen das Geschäft wegzunehmen. Und es geht um Sichtbarkeit, also den Eisberg sozusagen ein Stück anzuheben. Ähm, rechts unten zum Beispiel, das ist ein bisschen klein jetzt vielleicht, seht ihr das, eine Unterseite von einer Gewerkschaft auf der Unterseite, auf der Unterseite, da passieren auch immer wieder super wichtige Dokumentationen von Arbeitskämpfen und das fällt größtenteils unter den Tisch, weil es einfach sowas bei Flick eher schon gar nicht auftaucht und ähm, die Schwarz-Weiß-Bilder, die mittendrin sind, seht ihr, das sind eher so ikonografische Darstellungen, unten der tote Student Benno ohne Sorg, das Bild müssen wir uns heute von der dpa zurückkaufen. Ähm, Genau. Also, worum geht's? Mitmachen, weitersagen. Mir fällt zum Beispiel ein Problem gerade ein. Wir haben jetzt seit einem Monat knapp unsere Spenden, unsere Kampagnenseite online und wir kriegen jetzt gerade viele Zuschriften und sind gerade unsicher, wie wir diesen Dialog, der da entsteht gerade mit total viel interessierten, konstruktiven, also konstruktiven Anmerkungen, wie wir den transparent gestalten können. Also, wenn ihr dazu Ideen habt, ich werde jetzt noch eine Stunde ungefähr im Jugendhackt-Space rumhängen, äh, freue mich über Gespräche, kritische Anmerkungen und ansonsten meine Decknummer, die habe ich jetzt nicht hier auf den Folien, die ist 4558, genau und ansonsten auf der Seite könnt ihr auch mit uns in Kontakt treten und ansonsten, 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 ansonsten mitmachen, weitersagen und wenn ihr sogar Kohle habt, spenden und dann entsteht irgendwann eine Lösung für dieses Problem. Danke. Danke. Next up is AdaConf. How to create a three-track conference in 31 days. Hi everyone. I'm Emma. I'm from Malmö. That's in Sweden. Uh, this autumn, I was a volunteer at a wonderful conference called Fu Cafe that is having 400 events a year. Um, now we wanted to make a, a full day conference for only women and trans people. Why do we want that? Well, because there's popular demand, we want to do that. Um, we decided upon the date. Um, Whatever. We, we decided upon the date uh, 31 days uh, beforehand. Can you go to the next slide for me? Uh, just press the button to the right. Yeah, yes. that's what I did. Um, anyway, 31 days it took. Um, we made a call for papers and I was reaching out to my uh, very big um, social graph. Uh, and what I realized by doing this is when I restrained myself about who Uh, I am supposed to, um, who to reach out to. I realized how many women and trans people that are so competent that are out there um, that I wouldn't have reached out to if it wasn't for my own, um, for that I wanted to have only them at this place. Uh, it was also super, super fun to do because everyone that I spoke to They were like, yeah, I totally want to come. Uh, yeah, I'll totally want to come. Yeah, I'll come from San Francisco. Yes, I'll come from Washington. Uh, I'll come from London. Um, oh, I can't make it. Oh, 
I'll reschedule. It's okay. Um, and so we had this wonderful general purpose um, com uh, IT conference uh, with uh, topics like UX, we had accessible design, we had security, that was me. Um, we um, had this wonderful soldering station. Um, so we, uh, I think that soldering has such a revolutionary, beautiful power. Uh, because it looks very hard, and it totally isn't hard. Uh, it's like knitting, but only uh, with heat, basically. Um. <laughs> we had a, uh, uh, we were able to do this in only 31 days because uh, we were working in an agile fashion. Uh, we were focusing very hard on the minimal viable product. Um. And as you see, uh, it's very easy to feed w one's ego doing this uh, with this kind of uh, uh, feedback afterwards. Uh, we also wanted to do it very fast because, you know, I want to harbor, uh, harvest superpowers and the enthusiasm of people and also my own enthusiasm. And yes, you can go to the next slide. Uh, because AdaConf Zero was in Malmö uh, 25th of November. AdaConf One will be in Stockholm the 17th of March. Uh, the keynote is already decided upon. Uh, Anne-Marie Lövinde Eklund is uh, one of the key bearers to the internet. She's signing the DNS root zone. She's super duper cool. Um, and of course, I need people to do talks. I need people to do workshops. I want more um, open source contribution content. Uh, I want people who know to, how to solder. I know, want people who want to do all kinds of techy stuff together with us. So please get in touch. Uh, you have our Twitter handles here. It's AdaConf and me, I'm Emma Alstam. Thank you very much. Thank you. Sorry for the clicker trouble, I'll briefly check that. Maybe it has run out of batteries or something. Okay. Seems to work now. So next up is Neo PG. A replacement for GNU PG. Okay. So, hi, my name is Markus Brinkmann. I'm talking about Neo PG. Um, as I said, a replacement for GNU PG. Thank you. Um, GNU PG is approximately half a million lines of code, C code written over 20 years. Not many people read the source code, I guess, but if you do, you can find some interesting and strange things. For example, 400 command line options, not one, but actually two OpenPGP parsers, because the first one wasn't reusable, and a custom HTTP client and a DNS resolver. And for the people, for the whiteheads who like to break stuff, GluePG uh, is currently working on its own TLS library, already used on Windows. So uh, maybe take a look at that. Uh, what NuPG does not have is a library interface that allows application programmers to control and extend NuPG beyond what is already there. And the FAQ actually says that there will never be such a library. So can we just write a library and a better implementation? Maybe. But we have to implement the OpenPGP standard. And that is also 20 years old. And not many people read the standards, I guess. But if you do, you can find some interesting and strange things. For example, it still allows MD5 and IDEA, which are not secure anymore, and it is missing some important current cryptographic algorithms like a twisted curve cryptography. It also requires SHA-1 for fingerprints, and SHA-1 is currently, um, it's basically the next hash algorithm to be broken. And, uh, Two years ago, the IETF uh, working group reorganized and uh, worked on an update 
but last month the effort was terminated without result. The Secretary concluded that there is not sufficient interest to successfully complete the work of the working group. This is bad because we are now uh, using a 20 year old standard with a small update 10 years ago and there is no perspective for uh, future improvements. So um, I forked NUPG uh, in October and started to uh, refactor it and strip it down and remove obsolete stuff. And uh, the plan is to replace it with a library and a new command line uh, tool based on the library. And uh, of course, the next step is to implement new features. The current status is I removed 240,000 lines of code and 120 command line options. And I don't think you will miss anything. So, uh, so far it's looking good. Three months in and I'll continue. And we will see what happens in three months. NeoPG uh, will implement a new command line interface, which is based on the popular Git style subcommands. It will have a compatibility I interface. And uh, maybe things like terminal color output. We could work on that. Huh? It also will be easier to compile and build because it's based on CMake and comes as a single repository. And we target all the popular platforms. The library, which is currently only planned, will have an easy to use high level interface, but it will also give complete control at the low level because this is what actually makes new applications possible, which we don't anticipate. So all policy decisions will be uh, changeable for key management, trust models, and the data processing, like uh, putting in the password. We will delegate a lot of the work because we are a small team and um, I don't want to write my own HTTP client and stuff. So I, I, we will use standard libraries for common tasks. The C++ we can write the code more efficiently, and um, we will use the cryptographic library Botan, which is not uh, very well known, but it is well designed, and uh, it alone can replace about half of the GNU PG software stack because it comes with a TLS library too and many cryptographic algorithms and some interesting data processing. So we will focus on code quality too. All the good stuff like continuous integration testing and static code an analysis and so will be much easier. Uh, to this day, GNUPG relies mainly on the web of trust and open key servers to distribute uh, keys and verify user identities. There are many proposals how to do it differently and I think we should try to integrate some of them. Maybe we can tweet encrypted messages this way. Yeah, if you like this, you can check the website, the, the blog, and join the development on GitHub. Thank you. Thank you. Now the last talk before our break is right to internet access. Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Christina, and I'm going to speak to you about if internet access should be considered a human right. The aim of this presentation is to raise awareness about this concept and also to point out some aspects that need improvements or future, uh, future answers. I'll start with some facts regarding the right to internet access. In 2016, the UN and the United Nations released a non-binding resolution stating that the same rights people have offline must also be protected online. You can see here an extras from that text. However, even if the right to internet access was called as being a human right, the UN resolution only recommends actions for nation states and lacks any enforcement mechanisms. Uh, some countries have already taken affirmative action. You can see here some examples, including the fact that Finland was the first country where internet access was declared a human right. 
The model implemented in Finland is assuring broadband connection to all citizens, establishing a basic quantity and quality available to anyone. By 2010, the goal of the state was to assure basically a 1 megabits per second, and by 2015, to, uh, uh, to assure a 100 megabytes per second connection. Here, you can see a scale of the internet users by geographical zone in 2017. Also, almost 40% of the world population has access to internet today. However, there are some arguments against the right to internet access, and I will present to you four main critiques brought against considering it a human right. The first argument is about economical and political challenges around uh, the right to internet access. In order to make it applicable, practically states should have the necessary funds and infrastructure. This makes assuming responsibility for it at the world scale almost impossible. Also, the political challenges around the access to internet topic are very sensitive. Some states currently ban access to internet, censor it, create firewalls, or even convict currently people for, help for accessing internet. China's firewall is an example of such situation, and the fact that within Chinese territory, the internet is under the jurisdiction of Chinese so sovereignty. Uh, here, you can see the documented shutdowns happening in 2016 and 2017. For some, the states gave no reason at all, and for others, the reasons are considered false or hide real motives, like stopping protests or controlling elections. Considering the political and economical context, it's difficult to envision and persuade states to actively involve themselves in promoting internet access as a human right. The second argument is that internet currently is more a commodity than a human right. Internet is a technology like many others, as we well know, and access to it mostly is in charge of the private sector. The nature of it implies that in order to actually use internet, people need terminals, electricity, necessary infrastructure and maintenance. This creates a potential limitation of a human right. The third argument is that access to internet does not stand on its own as a value. It is often associated with freedom of expression, right to assembly, or right to development. The right to internet access can be considered a situation of uh, human rights inflation, where every separate group considers that uh, its interests have to become basically a human right. Also, the online environment is uh, the place for crime sometimes, or har harmful content. And this cannot stand on its own as values to be promoted and show that internet is a tool that uh, doesn't imply a certain value apart from the ones already existing. Now, the fourth argument is that we don't have a clear notion about the internet use, nor its evolution uh, in the future. The main purposes of internet are to be defined. And Society currently lacks a clear regulation in the matter. We can find a variety of activities that are happening online, and we cannot define internet by one in specific. Also, the evolution of it in the future can lead to situations where as a human right needs to be redefined or even not considered anymore a value. In the end, I'm going to leave you with a quote from Karl Popper that speaks about the fact that only critical discussion can give us the maturity to see an idea from more and more sides and to make a correct judgment of it. I hope you enjoyed the presentation and thank you. Thank you. So now we're going to have a break of 15 minutes. Uh, see you back in, at 12.45. Get a drink, get something to eat and come back. <laughs> see you.
Okay, it's 12.45 on my watch, so let's continue with the lightning talk session. Up next, privacy score. Oh, uh, short announcement uh, to the speakers. Please adjust the microphone before you talk so it points directly at your mouth and captures all the precious sound waves you generate. Let's go. Okay, hi everyone. Uh, I'm Max and I'm going to briefly present a project uh, that I did with uh, Dominic Hermann, who is by now professor at the University of Bamberg, and Pascal Wichmann and Henning Predul from the University of Hamburg. Um, and the motivation for the project is basically um, no one really knows what the hell's going on on a website at any given point when you visit it. So there might be like a bunch of third party trackers that are tracking your every move. Um, there were just a few days ago a new study was released that showed that some trackers actually embedded invisible login forms to harvest your login ID to use that to track you. So yeah, great. Um, and uh, we wanted to establish at least a baseline transparency about what the hell is going on on these websites. And to do this, we built Privacy Score. So Privacy Score is basically a web service that checks the privacy friendliness of a website. It checks for trackers, it checks for cookies, it checks if HTTPS is used for the uh, web server, checks if start TLS is used for the mail server, um, some general security questions like the use of security headers, um, and it also checks for uh, some information leaks like um, exposed uh, Git repositories, SQL dumps, um, stuff like this, and it's highly entertaining what you can find there. Um, we also make it possible to compare the results from multiple websites. So, in fact, um, if you go to our website, privacyscore.org, you can see a list of all uh, CCC, RFAS, and Chaos Treffs, and you can see the, uh, those websites ranked among each other. Um, and finally, as we just figured out over the last two weeks, uh, it is also great uh, if you want to get threatened with legal, uh, uh, with, with legal steps by the people you're scanning because we contacted a bunch of uh, insurance companies that we scanned and some of them basically responded by threatening us to, uh, that they would sue us if we didn't stop scanning them, so this was also highly entertaining. Um, by the way, we also wrote a paper on if, this, if what we're doing is actually legal, and yes, it is legal, so um, yeah. Uh, the technology is basically a Django web front end. Um, we're using the pretty awesome OpenWPM, uh, which is a headless Firefox browser that acts in every way like a regular Firefox browser. So it'll execute JavaScript and everything. And this gives you a very good idea of what is actually going to happen if you visit the website in a browser. Um, we're using testssl.sh for TLS analysis, um, Celery for distributed task queues. Um, we're using EasyList and Easy Privacy as filtering lists to check which websites are actually trackers that are embedded. And obviously, we use Sentry to catch the inevitable errors. All of this is open source software, which is really great. Um, and uh, in return, we also make our stuff available open source, obviously. So, uh, what we're looking for is um, we would like to see more checks. Um, so, if you have any ideas uh, what we could scan on a website, um, you can write an issue on our GitHub repository, which is listed down here. Um, preferably, it should be a check that doesn't land us immediately in jail. So, um, yeah, there, there have been some proposals where we're like, yes, that sounds really cool, but this also sounds like we would be in jail within like two weeks, so yeah, no. Um, we would like to see more lists of interesting websites that you would like to see ranked against each other. You can create a new list without any sign up or anything. We also obviously don't use any analytics on our server, so um, you're not being tracked while checking who is tracking you. We would like to see an API. We have some stubs for that, but nothing serious yet. Um, and yeah. Uh, if this sounds interesting to you, you can uh, fork the code on GitHub and you can visit the website privacyscore.org to see the results of any website you're interested in. For example, the list of CCC alphas. And with that, I'm done. Thank you. Next up is Moon Gen Packet Gen Generator. Hi, um, I'm Paul, and I gave a talk 
earlier than speak, but I had to speak very, very fast. But this time, I have way more time, so I can speak slightly slowlier. And it's about package generators this time. And, well, if people think of package generators, they often imagine big black hardware boxes full with FPGAs and so on. Um, but that is boring and stupid. We want to do the same thing in software. Now, what are the problems when doing that in, in software? Well, there are a few things that hardware package generators are really good at. And these are mainly at being expensive, at being fast, and at being precise, allegedly. But if we look at software package generators, they have a few other nice advantages. Like you run on cheap commodity hardware, you can take your Linux system, start the software, and send out packets at your the network interface. They are, however, usually quite slow and or imprecise, usually both. But they, the slowness gives them some flexibility because you can well, write code instead of some obscure configuration for some obscure hardware box thing. Now, what are the, the main problems that I'm trying to solve with the Moongen package generator? Is um, one, performance, because they are all slow and I don't want to be slow. And the second thing I wanted to solve is time stamping position for latency measurements. Meaning you typically, if you want to test a hardware device and you want to, to like get the measure the latency, how fast does it forward your packet, then you need something in the range of nanosecond position, and this is hard to do in software, obviously. So what we want to do with MoonGen is we want to combine the advantage of the software and the hardware package generators, and we mainly don't want to rely on hardware. Um, how do we do that? Well, for being fast, it's quite easy. We just use DPDK, which is this nice uh, framework, which has drivers for network cards that are fast. Um, then we build our whole API around multi-core awareness and so on, meaning we have also this nice NUMA aware feature because in the past we had this problem of, of like you had the NUMA system and the PCI Express bus is always attached to one CPU and people pinning their things to the wrong thing or the operating system pinning it wrong. So we automatically detect which thread uses which network card in uh, what manner and we automatically pin the thread to the core and pin the memory to the core so that you don't run into NUMA problems. Then we are, we are flexible. The, the trick here is <laughs> that we craft all packets in user-controlled Lua scripts. Uh, we use Lua JIT for that, which is this super, super fast uh, JIT compiler for, for Lua, which is also used in, in other projects. And for example, instead of configuring a, the package generator, or instead of, of uh, writing a complex configuration thing because I, I've used other package generators in the past. And the configuration was never enough. I needed features that were not configurable, that were not available, and in the end, I always had to change the code to add stuff for weird protocols and so on. So instead, we decided no configuration, it's scripting only, and the, your code gets run for every packet that is sent out in real time, and despite that, it's quite fast. For example, if you want to randomize something, you can just call the master.random function. If you want another distribution of your random stuff, call a different function. If you want a counter, at a counter, and so on. And we have support for complex protocol stacks with a code generator that generates code for stacks. For example, if you want Ethernet in IP, in VXLAN, in UDP, in another VXLAN, in an Ethernet that is VLAN tagged in another VXLAN, and below that a Q&Q tag, no worries, you can do that. And other package generators often fail at that. And for precision, well, you, if you need nanosecond level precision or accuracy, then you really have to use hardware. But if you read the data sheet of a few commodity NICs carefully, you will see that there are timestamping features in there that are meant for PTP time synchronization. You can kind of set the right registers in the right way, and then you can timestamp almost arbitrary packets, and you get nanosecond level accuracy. So is it fast? Because I'm always about fast. Well, yes. Um, if you send minimum sized packets, then you can easily get uh, above 10 gigabits per second per CPU core for comparison like your Trev Gen or whatever legacy package generator gets around 300,000 packets per second maybe, and we get 15 million packets per second per CPU core. And with easy scaling, we can, we can scale to multiple NICs, multiple or multiple, queue, multiple queues on one NIC, 
um, we have tested this with packet rates above 100 G with several 40 gigabit NICs easy. The, the latency measurements are at nanosecond level and all of this while running custom user-defined code for every single packet that is sent out in real time. Okay, to conclude, check it out on GitHub. It's open source MIT license. Um, I think no one ever scanned that QR code. I hope it works. Thank you. Thank you. Please, please give a big hand for the translation team. <laughs> so next up is Om Nom Nom. Yeah, welcome everybody. I'm Max from Berlin. I'm a computer science student and system engineer, and I want to talk about a little open source project of mine. Oh, I forgot the thing here. Um, yes. OmnomRom is an open source Telegram chatbot. It's available under the nick OmBot, and it's aware of a lot of canteen menus. Um, Telegram is a messenger like Signal or WhatsApp, and in 2015 they introduced a bot API, so it's very easy to develop software for the framework, uh, for the application. One day later, I released the first version of the bot. It was very raw, only 200 lines of Python code that crashed all the time but it worked for four canteens in Berlin, and it looked like that. Um, you see me asking for the menu of the Mark canteen in Berlin, and you get results, some dishes, and prices. Um, yeah, a lot of people liked it at TU Berlin, and so three years later, and several code iterations later, it looks now like this. Um, again, on the left side, you see me asking for the same menu, but you have a lot more information like, is the, meat, uh, is the food vegan or the, is meat? Do you have the business hours and additional information from the canteens? Also, it supports 55 canteens today, and it's very fast. Um, in the beginning, it took five to 10 seconds for an answer, and now it's under a second. And yeah, on the right side, you see a long list of canteens, and you can scroll and select the one you want to know more about. At university, people keep to ask me how it works. And so I decided to give this talk about the internals of the bot. Um, yeah, from 200 lines of Python, it went up to five Docker containers. Um, you have the Telegram API, and every time a user sends a message to the bot, I receive the message from the API in the front-end application. It's, uh, yeah, it's quite a simple Python script that parses the message, decide which canteen is requested and which dates. You can also ask for menus or tomorrow, for example. Then it checks the Redis database for the menu and response. But the harder part is to get the information into the Redis database. That works in a Celery application. Celery is a Python uh, task queue. And a task queue is made of two parts. Uh, you have some software that puts tasks into the queue and other software that takes tasks task out of the queue and does the work. So we have the beat container. Beat is also part of Celery. It just schedules regular tasks like cron. And my tasks are parse websites or parse PDF files. So this is not a complicated container, but it needs to be there to scan all websites every few hours. So the hard part happens in the worker container. It's uh, yeah, the part that takes the task and executes them. So for different canteens, I have to write different parsers to extract all information and then put the results into the Redis database. I decided to go with Celery because it works pretty well for long-running tasks. So as soon as resources are available, I will scan the next website without uh, yeah, overloading my server. Um, that's basically all you need to run the bot. I have an additional container. I call it housekeeping. It does stuff like uh, sending error messages to me, independent from the normal website processing, in case something happens with the bot. And it also writes some statistics about the user, user well, not so much about the users, but more about which canteens are requested and how often. So that's all you need for the bot, but to make my own life easier, I built a few more containers around it. Uh, so it starts to look a little bit complicated, and I say myself, I over-engineered it a little bit. And <laughs> but yeah, I learned a lot. So 
I have a deployment chain to reduce my own SSH usage to the server. Every time I take a GitHub commit for a new release, uh, I run, uh, yeah, that triggers tests in drone. Dro Drone.io is an awesome CI CD framework which runs on Docker and then automatically it builds the new Docker images. If the test succeeds, pushes the images to Docker Hub, which is a lot faster than letting Docker Hub building the images. As soon as Docker Hub is received the images, they trigger a webhook again at a container at my server, it's the webhooks container, and that then uh, yeah, starts a new deployment of the, server, of the bot. So it replaces all containers in the gray box above if necessary. So by this, oh, my time is up, so I will forward. Um, there are a few more containers about the website and code documentation. And yeah, currently I have like 50 messages a day. Thank you. If you have any questions, talk to me. Uh, okay. It's the last day. We're all a bit slow. I forgot the countdown. Okay, next up is uh, something that's maybe a bit difficult for the English speaking people. But uh, yeah, let's, let's try it anyway. I don't, I don't even know if that counts as German, but I think technically it does. So let's go. Ich fange dann einfach mal an. Oh, die letzte Vorträge war gerade alle auf Englisch und ich habe gedacht, das verstanden so viele. Gibt es da Handel Leute, die Schwäbisch gut verstanden? Also, Baden-Württemberg, Schweiz und so, ja, gell, okay, das, na, 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 glaube ich, da geht es. Ähm, also ich, ich mache jetzt einen Vortrag auf Schwäbisch, weil ihr blöde Wette auf Twitter gemacht habt. Ich habe gesagt, <lacht> ich, ich habe gesagt, sie machen einen Vortrag auf Schwäbisch, wenn ihr mir 100 Retweets gebt. Und drunter geschrieben habe ich, ich mache auf Bayerisch, wenn ihr mir über 100 Likes gebt. Jetzt habe ich aber über 100 Likes, aber ich habe gar, gar kein Bayerisch. Was von das für ein Scheiß? Ähm, ja, jetzt mache ich mal einen Vortrag. Ähm, Achso, ja genau, die, die Folie hätte ich vorher weiterschalten können, da, da seht ihr, warum ich das gemacht habe. Und ich mache es halt immer so, wenn einer etwas bestellt, dann liefere ich es halt. Ja? Ich kann jetzt nicht, auch nicht einfach sagen, ich mache das nicht. So, jetzt halte ich einen Vortrag auf Schwäbisch und ich kann jetzt auf Schwäbisch nicht unbedingt einen technischen Vortrag machen, weil dann sagen die Leute, hey, das ist aber nicht sehr inklusiv, wenn ihr den auf Schwäbisch machst, dann könntet ihr bloß 20.000 Leute verstanden oder so, ja. Ähm, dann habe ich mal gesagt, ich mache was Urschwäbisches, ich mache einen Vortrag, wie man Spätzle macht. <lacht> Weil, also ich weiß selber nicht, wo das mit Nudeln generell herkommen ist. Also es gab ja so Sachen, dass es vor, vor ein paar tausend Jahren schon in China Nudeln gab, verschiedener Art. Ähm, und das, das ist weltweites Phänomen mit Nudeln. Also die, die, die sind irgendwie in 20 Arten irgendwo auf der ganzen Welt ver, äh, erfunden worden. Und die schwäbische Version davon, das sind die Spätzle. Also wenn ihr mal schaut, Pasta Flowchart, ähm, da, da gibt es so, so ein Bild, das hat mal einer zusammengestellt, da gibt es dann so alle möglichen italienischen Nudelarten und sowas. Und eine Nudelart beschreibt und das sind die Spätzle. Ähm, also Pasta und Spätzle ist ein bisschen was anderes, weil, äh, genau. Ja, jetzt, wie macht man Spätzle? Das erste, das Wichtigste ist, du nimmst einen Haufen Eier. Ja? Jetzt, jetzt kommen immer Leute und sagen, ja, wie viel soll ich denn nehmen? Ja, dann sage ich zu dem auch so, ja, gibt es ja im KSA eine Einheit für Eier oder was? Ja, bei Mehl das Gleiche, okay, ich, ich tue jetzt ein Kilo Mehl rein, weil ich habe ein paar Leute zum Versorgen. Ähm, und ein bisschen Salz muss auch rein, weil sonst äh, schmeckt es ein bisschen fad. Manche Leute gehen auch ein bisschen pfeffig rein, weil äh, die Mehl ist ein bisschen schärfer. Ja, kannst du auch gleich Spätzle mit Chili machen oder sowas. Ja, Wäre vielleicht einmal eine Challenge, wie scharf kannst wie, wie scharf kannst machen und kannst noch essen. Und... <lacht> Ja, dann füllst du das Ganze mit Wasser auf und fängst an rumzurühren, dass es halt, ähm, dass es halt einen Deug gibt. Ja? Ähm, bei meiner Oma ist das so, ihr könnt euch vorstellen, meine Oma hat etwa mein Umfang gehabt, ja, aber sie war bloß so groß. Und dann hat sie den Hafer mit dem Deig genommen und hat sie den gerührt und hat immer so ein bisschen aggressiv reingeschaut. Ja? Und dann hat sie das eine halbe Stunde lang gemacht und ähm, ja, dann ging es dann ging's ans Schabe. Ja? Ähm, achso, jetzt habe ich es auf dem Handy weitergeschaltet, aber da nicht. Das ist aber schade. Äh, es geht immer los, du machst schon einmal Wasser heiß. Du hast auch ein bisschen Salz, na ja, Salz ist nie zu viel. Ja. Ähm, und da gibt es verschiedene Möglichkeiten, wie du es mach, machen kannst. Die richtig schöne Art ist das Schabe. Du brauchst ein Spatzebrett. Ja. Nimmst das Spatzebrett. Ich, ich, ich kann es jetzt bloß zeigen, weil ich war zu faule Folie zu machen. Ich habe keine Fotos mehr machen können. 
Ähm, nimmst du ein Spatzebrett, hältst du es schräg da drüber durch den Bad Steig da drauf und dann schabst du es nein, aber richtig zügig, ja, nicht langsam schabe, richtig schnell. Und äh, dann wartest du, bis der Wal drüber geht. Ja, weißt du noch, was das heißt, Wal drüber geht? Das ist, wenn so, wenn so der Schaum oben drauf rumkocht. Ja? Äh, und dann kannst du mit einem Schaumlöffel oder so etwas, dann kannst du die dann rausschaufeln ja, und dann machst du die nächste Portion. Natürlich kann man es auch nicht geschabt machen, sondern mit der Spatzepresse. Und das war bei meiner Oma dann früher immer so. Also bei uns daheim haben wir es halt auch immer so mit der Spatzepresse gemacht. Und dann hat sie immer gesagt, Haus, komm schon mal, komm, ich muss jetzt Spatze reindrucken. Ja, und dann bin ich vom Computer aufgestanden und habe natürlich keinen Bock gehabt, da jetzt für eine halbe Stunde rumzustehen, weil ich wollte wieder zurück und irgendwas rumfrickeln, ja. Und dann bin ich halt raus, habe den, hab den, äh, 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 den Hafen von der Spatzepresse voll gemacht, ja, bis oben noch, ohne halt mit der Saugkraft reindrückt. Meine Oma ist jedes Mal schon wahnsinnig, worden, weil es dann halt keine Spätzle gibt, sondern halt irgendwie so Regenwürmer, ja. Aber schmecke du es schon geil, gell? So, und jetzt habe ich da halt einen Tippfehler her, man dachte, naja gut, das ist jetzt nicht so schlimm. Ist ja eh Dialekt, ja. Und was man dazu isst, das Beste, das Beste was du machen kannst zu Spätzle, ist natürlich Sauerbraten, aber ja, Spätzle kann ich auch so essen, weil wenn meine Oma die dann immer so nachgestellt hat, dann stand die über Nacht in der Küche. Das hat sie sich schnell abgewöhnt. Die haben dann am nächsten Tag in sie gefehlt. Die fresst die einfach so raus. Ja. Und ein Trollinger dazu saufen, das ist natürlich ganz schwäbisch, ja. Ja. So, ich denke, ich bin fertig. Danke, ciao. Danke. Okay, so, next up ist äh, freie Software und freies Wissen Dresden. Fork us in real life. Ja, hallo, ich hoffe, ihr könnt mich hören. Meine Stimme ist vom Kongress etwas lediert und ähm, ich lege mal los. Wir sind die Hochschulgruppe für freie Software und freies Wissen aus Dresden. Und äh, es soll darum gehen, also ja, genau, eine Hochschulgruppe ist so eine Vereinigung von Leuten an der Uni, die halt zusammen Projekte machen und äh, irgendwie versuchen, die Hochschulpolitik einzugreifen oder auch äh, Services für die Studierenden anbieten für alle, die es nicht wissen. Und wir, sind, wir verstehen uns so als so eine Art Lobbygruppe für freie Software und freies Wissen. Und bei uns ist die Hochschule, sind also Hochschulangehörige die Zielgruppe unserer Arbeit und die Hochschule ist auch unser Arbeitsfeld, da die Hochschule uns Räume und Strukturen einfach zugänglich macht. Unsere bisherigen Projekte könnt ihr jetzt auf der Folie sehen. Das sind einige besonders hervorheben. Sollten wir vielleicht das Unistick-Projekt, wo wir jetzt im zweiten Jahr äh, Sticks mit debian live system an unsere Erstis verteilt haben. Und außerdem machen wir eine monatliche Sprechstunde zu LaTeX, manchmal Workshops, Crypto-Partys, Linux-Install-Partys und so weiter. Und ja, warum an der Hochschule? Natürlich hat man an der Hochschule einen direkten Bezug zur freien Wissensverbreitung. Die äh, problematische Monopolstellung der Wissenschaftsverlage ist inzwischen äh, jedem klar, auch den äh, alten Säcken, die denken, aber weiter so ist doch eigentlich gut. Und zum Teil, das war auch einer der wichtigen Anhaltspunkte für uns, findet Produktschulung statt, dass zum Beispiel MATLAB in, äh, vorgeschrieben ist. Und das führt natürlich zu äh, Abhängigkeit von Herstellern, Vendor-Login. Und das können wir als äh, Hacker nicht wollen. Also haben wir uns gedacht, wir versuchen dagegen irgendwie ein bisschen Propaganda zu machen. Und natürlich werden an der Hochschule die äh, also Führungskräfte der Zukunft ausgebildet. Das heißt... Wenn wir es schaffen, dort den Leuten nahezubringen, dass freie Software gut ist, dann äh, wird das vielleicht auch in die Unternehmen getragen. Unsere Vision ist also, durch Schulung und Support, die wir an der Uni anbieten, die Verbreitung von freier Software unter Studierenden zu erhöhen. Dann diese Sensibilisierung für freie Software mit den Absolventen und Absolventinnen in die Wirtschaft zu tragen. Und durch unsere Projekte, also durch unsere inhaltlichen Projekte an der Hochschule, Reputation zu sammeln, die wir als politisches Kapital einsetzen können in der Diskussion mit der Hochschule über äh, hochschulpolitische Themen mit Softwarebezug. Und schließlich wünschen wir uns Breitenwirkung durch Forks an allen deutschen Hochschulen. Und deswegen möchten wir es, euch jetzt die Anleitung geben, Fork us in real life und auch die Bitte an euch. Also was man machen muss, ist eigentlich gar nicht so schwer. Irgendwie drei Leute finden, äh, ein Gründungstreffen planen, bewerben und abhalten. 
und äh, schließlich regelmäßige Treffen organisieren. Also es ist natürlich klar, man fängt irgendwie mit äh, 100 Leuten beim Gründungstreffen an und dann werden es irgendwann nur noch 10, aber man kann halt arbeiten. Und äh, schließlich braucht man ein bisschen Infrastruktur, Mailinglisten, Homepage, asoziale Medien, um äh, Werbung machen zu können, um seine Veranstaltungen zu planen, um die interne Koordination machen zu können. Und dann kann man einfach erste Projekte angeben. Sprechstunde anbieten für LaTeX zum Beispiel, das ist natürlich an der Uni sehr wichtig, ähm, Krypto-Partys oder auch ein Positionspapier formulieren, auf das man verweisen kann, wenn man irgendwie versucht, seine Position zu verbreiten. Ja, und wenn man das gemacht hat, was kommt dann? Fragezeichen, 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 Profit. So, also, wir sind die FSFB, Fork Us in Real Life, äh, nehmt Kontakt mit uns auf, wenn ihr Interesse habt, wir helfen gerne, wir können euch was über unsere Technik erzählen, die wir so gebraucht haben, wir können, uns von euren, also wir können euch was von euren Erfahrungen sammeln, wenn es echt gut, wenn es an anderen, Hochschul an anderen Hochschulen auch Gruppen wie die unsere gäbe. Danke sehr. Thank you. Danke. So, next up is uh, all creatures welcome. Hello, people. This talk is not going to be very easy to listen to. It's not very easy to give. But I believe that at this moment, we as a community are going to need to be strong. However, not everybody needs to be strong all the time. And if this is a moment when you don't think that you can address this content, I'm going to ask you just to step out the door for a few minutes. And uh, I apologize for the inconvenience. So let me tell you where I'm coming from here. It's my hobby is to try to make the world a little bit better than it was before. And I find there are two bit types of problems that we face in the world. One is the type that we don't really know how to fix. Stuff like war, neoliberalism, they're terrible, but when we try to solve them, we end up in a game theoretical quagmire and we don't really have an answer for it. Then there are the other issues, the ones which we could probably fix if we could all just have the courage to sit down and talk about it. I am not really qualified to give this talk. It's not my area of expertise, but I believe that the silence on this topic has only served to perpetuate patterns which are unacceptable. So, let's talk about something hard. Rape has touched the lives of almost exactly 10% of the American population, including 3% of men. I'm using American statistics here because they're more accessible, but I'm not aware of any culture where this is not a problem. If we are to believe that the world, a, a number of fairly prominent community members, something really awful has been happening here over and over again. I don't want to talk about the accusations or the people involved or in the center of them. What I want to talk about are the reactions. I've heard everything from, oh, it was just one person saying this, and that was recanted, even complex conspiracy theories to explain how the whole thing had been fabricated. I've heard just about everything other than acceptance of the possibility that what happens in America every 98 seconds might be taking place here as well. So I decided to begin compiling reports that I could show people that the accusations were in fact coming from a large group of very credible sources and what I made still exists. I don't intend to shame the person in this story. It's not productive and really, I don't know for a fact that he did anything at all, but I do know that this happens all of the time. <clears throat> I intend to speak about the culture of disbelief, apologism, and cover-up, which allows these types of atrocities to flourish. This is an issue which the justice system is famously bad at dealing with. It's estimated that 54% of rapes are never reported to the police, and of those which are reported, only 2.2% lead to felony convictions. I often hear innocent until proven guilty as an argument, which makes sense in a world where the guilty get put in a cage and cut off from the world for years of their lives. But when innocent until proven guilty is used as an objective, objection to community efforts to ensure people's safety, what I hear is, not my problem, I don't care. Now, there's been some really important efforts made in the past years, and I don't want to belittle what the participants have managed to do. I want to thank the security team and the awareness team for their role in making this a safer conference to attend. But this was dishear But it was disheartening to hear that someone ripped this poster off the wall 
and it sickens me to imagine that the person who did it could have been involved in the de-escalating, mediating, and effectively covering up atrocities com committed by patterned repeat offenders. This is the creator of the Mastodon Protocol, who I sadly, sorry, project, who I sadly did not have the, pr the privilege of meeting here because his view is that the, a community with such a cavalier attitude toward this topic is not a safe place to be. And this is not the only person I'm aware of who has decided to stay home because of this culture. For me, the CCC is an extremely important institution. Not only is it a place for meeting of many different communities, but it, is cr it critically creates a cultural answer to Silicon Valley's toxic culture. But if this culture does not ex insist that the weak be protected from the strong, what claim do we have that we are any better than Silicon Valley in the first place? So what can we do? Again, I want to applaud the great efforts that have been made by the awareness team and others. You're, you're on the side of angels, keep fighting. One thing that we can all do right now is stop describing sexual assault as drama. Rape happens to one in 10 people. I don't think I need anything more than statistics to say, not only can it happen here, it does happen here. I don't need to believe in the stories. Finally, I invite you to join me in demanding that the organization committee submit to independent observation of their safety process. I want a well-known and well-regarded specialist in sexual violence prevention to have full access to all the meetings, interviews, and deliberation. Obviously, these matters are very sensitive and proceedings must be kept strictly private, but we can insist that an outside observer to certify that these matters are being taken seriously and handled appropriately. This issue is not specific to the CCC. It is present everywhere. We are not the worst, but we can be better. Let's do that. Thank you. Thank you. Then next up is civil clauses, a sound approach for banning military use from civil institutions. Yes, hello. Um, I'm Besto. I'm Juan, thanks. And uh, yeah, it's about civil clauses uh, at uh, especially universities. So the problem is, uh, well, please, we all know, please we all stay know in front that of the some, mic. Yeah, yeah. yeah sorry. Uh, we all know that uh, some people really love to work for the military, and uh, there are also others that also strongly object to killing people. Now, uh, if you're working, uh, as you can choose your own employer, that's not a problem. But if you're in your education and uh, you work for a university or um, something similar, then you might run into the problem that you cannot choose actually the project you're working on. And sometimes you don't even know what the project is in the end about. So uh, that might cause some conflict for, for you, and uh, that's why people came up with the idea of civil clauses. So to solve this, pro uh, this conflict, some universities in Germany, even some states, in Germany came up with the idea of so-called civil clauses. These prohibit the military projects with these universities or the states. Uh, and the state of Bremen wrote 2005, uh, 15 in its Higher Education Act that schools of higher education pursue in research education and studies exclusively peaceful means. The resources provided by the state to these schools are exclusively for aims that follow these proposed. Next. And since the 1950s, there are several institutions, civil institutions, and also um, states which uh, gave their, uh, such a civil clause, and there are more coming up. Yeah. Now, um, there is, of course, since all will, this uh, war is peace saying, uh, so what are peaceful purposes? I mean, this is a nice act, but uh, what is it? So the interpretation of the University of Applied Sciences in Bremen uh, had their own interpretation, and the first thing they did was they signed a collaboration agreement with the German Bundeswehr, which is like the German army. Uh, so they're offering a course uh, for comp female computer science scientists uh, 
uh, for programming at the German army. Um, now, uh, this of course caused some conflict, uh, like for example, the uh, student council, they did this banner and hang it out of the building, uh, which said, uh, we educate to kill. Uh, they had to remove the banner because the German army claimed, uh, in this, uh, this, this case, copyright. So, um, <laughs> yeah, nevertheless, the conflict is still on. <laughs> And, uh, of course, uh, the civil clause is it's a dispute, disputed thing. Uh, nevertheless, we say um, it's good to have these causes, clauses. Yeah, we believe that it's good to have such a clause um, because you actually have then the freedom to say no, to say no to uh, military usage of your work. And we think that that's a very important point. Uh, because if you're bound to your university during your studies, you really don't have such a freedom. And uh, civil clauses at least give people the chance to fight for the rights to reject. And it's not always possible, or it's, not, it's a hard fight. However, well, there is no guarantee that you're safe in this account, and you really don't have a guarantee that after you publish your work uh, that it's not misused. Next. Yeah, nevertheless, I think it's, we at least think it's a still ongoing struggle. And it's also, of course, the question of, you know, what are we working for directly or indirectly? And so uh, we think it's a decision that needs to be brought on. And we will be, uh, after the lightning talks here at the emergency exit doors uh, for further discussions, if you have questions for us, or you can write at this email. Thank you. Thank you. So then next up is uh, Circle of Hope. I think they are taking over the stage then in the majority right now. We are only two. All right, let's go. Hello. Oh my God, there's a lot of people here. Hello. How you doing? Uh, we're from Hackers on Planet Earth. We're an American hacker conference. Uh, before we talk about why you should care about an American hacker conference, I'd like to say a few words about why you should care about an American civil liberties organization, namely the Electronic Frontier Foundation. Uh, these guys are fighting battles for all of us. Uh, I saw an excellent talk here. I saw an excellent talk here yesterday about enforcing net neutrality, enforcing net neutrality. In the States, we're trying to destroy net neutrality. And I guarantee if, if the powers that be succeed in destroying net neutrality there, they will come here next and destroy it in Europe as well. So EFF's victories are our victories. And please, please, before they leave today at 4 p.m., visit them over at CCL opposite the Tea House and donate whatever you can to keep them, uh, keep them alive, keep them going, keep them flourishing, uh, get t-shirts. We have our hacker calendar over there as well, uh, a donation for every, every sale of that. Um, we were just looking at the dates actually, and, and we noticed that today, we have virtually every day of the year if something happened in hacker history. Uh, but today, December 30th, nothing happened. It's an empty, an empty day, so please hack something so that next year <laughs> we can fill that space. It would be nice if maybe we could say on December 30th of, of 2017, someone gave uh, a Bitcoin to EFF at, at the CCC. Wouldn't that be amazing? Anyway, I'd like to turn it over to uh, my fellow HOPE um, uh, organizers here uh, who are going to talk about the Circle of Hope next year. Uh, Mitch, Aesthetics, and Kyle. Yeah, so uh, this is going to be our 12th Hackers on Planet Earth conference. It's very much influenced by this conference and very much influenced by all that all of us have learned here and brought to our fair country uh, that so poorly needs this kind of energy with a fantastic mix of uh, organization, German organization, and, uh, and anarchy, German anarchy. And we have this uh, kind of thing going on at Hope July 20th to 22nd in New York City. Yeah, so this 
Yeah, so this is a great excuse to uh, visit the United States if you've been really e eager to do so, especially in the last year or so. So, yeah, it, it's a lot of fun. We've had a lot of um, really interesting uh, speakers over the years, a lot of cool projects. Uh, we have lockpicking villages. We've, we've tried to model a lot of things that we've been inspired by, especially at Congress, and trying to recreate it. So if you want to help to spread the gospel of Congress, uh, no pun intended and so on, um, please come to Hope and uh, share the wealth and uh, make everyone happy. Yeah, I don't... I'd also reiterate the, um, the uh, sentiment that the spirit of sharing and uh, at times collaboration has inspired us to do quite a bit of things uh, in America and at Hope. Uh, one of those things has been infrastructure. We've been uh, inspired and, and, um, and really are thankful to some of the great um, ideas and things that come from events like 34C3 uh, that have enabled, enabled us to increase our bandwidth and um, do really exciting things with infrastructure. Right now, I'm, as far as we know, we can say we're an event that has the fastest uh, uplink uh, for a, uh, a conference in the U.S. Um, and right now, uh, the last two events, we've had uh, 10 gigabit which is pretty fast for us, and uh, we're um, planning and, um, and looking forward to increasing that to 100 this year. So uh, that's one of many things. We've got uh, projects, workshops. Please submit some stuff, uh, share, or just come and experience it. Meet some new people. Um, we need uh, uh, people from other parts of the world to share with Americans that might not be traveling, that might not be exposed to other ideas. And that's definitely where people like you come in. Um, I could go on, but that's, that's really uh, what I wanted to express to you. We know a lot of people are afraid to come to the United States. We understand that. Uh, but the, the way you, you, um, you fight uh, injustice is to confront it, just as a previous speaker said here. Uh, if you are unhappy with something, you don't turn your back you go right straight for it, and, and you, uh, you confront the issue and you make it better. And that's, that's the case in the United States, and I think that's the case in the hacker culture in general. Uh, when we see a problem, we tackle it. We don't run away from it. So I hope to see people do that for our conference and for future conferences. Please visit us, hope.net. We should be opening up speaker submissions in the next couple of weeks, and uh, take it registration as well. Thanks. Thank you. So then next up is Noise Bridge. I think there's some personal overlap there. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, so uh, let me just get up the slides. <laughs> All right, let's go. OK. So um, we're all part of NoiseBridge, uh, part of really the beginning of NoiseBridge. I'm one of the co-founders, and this is Aesthetics and Scotty. And uh, NoiseBridge is one of the early hackerspaces in the United States, super influenced by CCC, Seabase. Oop, next slide. Um, we're an anarchist hackerspace with only one rule, which is be excellent to each other. Highly influenced by Seabase and this event uh, that had a talk about how to start your own hackerspace, the hackerspace design patterns. So at NoiseBridge, there's all kinds, there's a wide variety of things that go on. Um, NoiseBridge has had um, a lot of things similar to Hope. There's been uh, crafting going on. There's been hardware hacking. Uh, Mitch was doing the Monday uh, hard, circuit, hard, hacking. Hard, yeah, circuit hacking and so on. And uh, it, it's, it, it's actually really difficult for, for me to say there's so many cool things that are going on there. So, Yeah, sure. So uh, this was uh, actually one of our first events in the space, uh, Five Minutes of Fame. Uh, which is you know, similar to a, a lightning talk <laughs> style event um, and is something we've done throughout the, the history of the space. Um, yeah, actually, this is one of the uh, five minutes of fame we did that um, we, we thought it would be really cool to play a 3D video, and we got 3D glasses for everyone, and uh, our friend Ruben, who's also an Bridge member, took this really cool black and white photo. And I uh, also want to point out, this was the, uh, the current space, 2169 mission. This was the inaugural event, and uh, I hosted that, and I'm really privileged to have been able to do so. So thank you to the Bridge community. And this event actually was in 3D. <laughs> Yeah, we've got lots of uh, classes and workshops and all sorts of diverse things. Like, these are just a few of the things I threw together just uh, to give some representation. 
Um, but uh, as an early hackerspace in the United States, we've been an example for many, many people uh, all over the world, inspiration to start hackerspaces, and we want to continue to do that. Uh, what, we would just had our 10-year anniversary where we showed off some collaborative projects that are really big, like this one, which was way influenced, copied by uh, the Seabase uh, crates of Mata bottles with RGB LEDs in them, we call it Flosh and Toshin. And uh, this is supposed to be a video, uh, unfortunately it's not, but uh, this is uh, showing Star Wars in very, very high low res. So um, <laughs> we had a Star Wars night. Uh, we want to keep present uh, a noise bridge um, uh, going for decades to come, but we just experienced our 10-year anniversary and we had a big party with four days exhibition in Ball, we called it. A lot of people showed off cool things and we had some surprising guests, like that person in the lower right. Yeah, um, but uh, the, the community is uh, the strongest it's been in um, many years, uh, both in terms of um, participants, but also financially. Uh, we have eight months of operating expenses in the bank, and it's been going up uh, month over month, um, which is really exciting. Um, but we are facing an existential crisis. Uh, we, our landlord has chosen not to renew our lease. Uh, and uh, that we think, they, they haven't said this directly, but we think that it is because they are spooked by increased pressure from city inspectors. Uh, that are caused by one vindictive person uh, who has been using the city machinery to come after Noisebridge. Uh, Fun times. Yeah, mm -hmm. in terms of code enforcement and, um, and zoning enforcement. Uh, and so uh, we, are, we are facing uh, 2018 with the knowledge that we need to uh, significantly up our game and that it's gonna be a very uh, transformative time for our community. Indeed, we have to uh, come up with ways that keep the spirit of Noisebridge alive and increase our budget by three times. So um, that's the challenge we're facing, but we faced lots of big challenges before, some super big challenges, and we've overcome them every time. It just brings people together and we get stronger as, as a result. So, somewhat similar, perhaps, to having to move to Hamburg from Berlin and increase from 3,000 people to 12,000, or now 15,000 here in Leipzig. Um, it brings our community together, together and makes us stronger. Yeah, I, I'd say that you know, we've faced existential crises in the past as a space, uh, and um, it's been nothing but a benefit to us um, uh, in bringing our community together and, and uh, in, uh, causing our community to invest more time and energy, but also this time money. Yeah, so this is something that a lot of places are going to have to face as uh, cities are getting more and more expensive with gentrification and often uh, overpricing us out of the neighborhoods we often help to create. So um, if you feel good about helping Noisebridge uh, and helping us help other people, uh, come talk to us and uh, we'll look forward to uh, playing with you all in the future. And if anyone wants any Noisebridge stickers, <laughs> All right, thank you. So that concludes our lightning talk session for this day and also for this Congress. I hope you had a great Congress and had as much fun as we did with this session. So uh, please give a big hand for all the talkers. And also, all the, of course, all the angels involved around this event. 